Okay, y'all, let's talk about the limbic system in lecture 11-2. So the limbic system contains a lot of these uh, kind of baser uh, functionality of the telencephalon that informs the, the hypothalamus and our memory and all of that that we've been discussing. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, what the role of the limbic system is, how these things are organized, and how they're connected. So limbic system is receiving all of this sensory information. Uh, it's getting collaterals about our state of being, about our environment around us, and it's using that information to uh, direct the focus of our attention on specific stimuli. So if, for instance, there's something more important going on in your visual field, um, that you suddenly you know, see uh, something that is positive, uh, then you're not blanking out everything else visually, but the focus of your mental energy is on that one particular thing in your visual field. Your uh, limbic system is emphasizing that information because it's associating it with a memory uh, when something good happened in relation to that thing you're seeing or a thing you're hearing or, or whatever else. So in that way, it changes the level of your attention on certain things. Uh, so this level of attention uh, is necessary for forming memories and for uh, eliciting uh, memories. Uh, it's monitoring our internal state of being through our vagus nerve and our visceral sensation. And again, uh, all of you know all of that example I just gave. It's also processing senses of reward and, and bringing up memories of, of uh, rewarding rewarded actions or rewarded environments. So it's kind of combining uh, our emotional sense, our memory, our sensory information, and our homeostasis all into one thing so it can, uh, you know, play a role in decision making, in memory formation, and in our autonomic processes. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, James Papes who um, early on identified um, many of these regions of the central uh, limbic systems and how they were connected as well. So uh, first of all, let's talk about some of these regions. I've belabored these in previous lectures. You've got the hippocampus connected to the mammillary bodies via the fornix. You've got the amygdala, stria terminalis, uh, terminalis to the hypothalamus. Uh, so let's look at some of these other regions too. We've talked about the cingulate gyrus before, cingulate gyrus here in red, uh, in terms of its directing of arousal states, so tension, uh, as well as error correction. So remember the Stroop's task, or the Stroop's test, where um, a, a, the name of a color is written in a different color of ink. So the word red is written in yellow, and you have to very quickly say one or the other. Uh, and that is a potent activator of the cingulate gyrus. Pain is activated in the anterior cingulate gyrus. So if there's a painful stimulus, uh, then the cingulate gyrus is being activated as well. Not shown here is the insula, which is processing a lot of that uh, parasympathetic uh, vagus nerve visceral afferent information from how our body uh, internally is doing. Uh, what's going on at that moment. It's, uh, the insula is also responsible for our sense of taste from the SVAs, um, as well as things like emotional, create, emotional uh, state of well-being as well. Um, it does some auditory processing um, more, anterior, more posteriorly, um, but something else that's interesting about both the cingulate and the uh, insular cortices is that they are activated when we witness somebody else in distress. So when somebody else, you know, you watch those videos of some dude landing on his genitals while he was like skateboarding down a, a railing or something, and you get that impactful, physical, painful sense, or, you know, somebody trips and face plants or whatever. You watch all of these stupid videos where this stuff happens. And you feel that um, kind of impactful, painful sense, although you, it's not as, uh, you know, uh, somatically um, apparent. But 
that's because the cingulate gyrus and the insular cortex um, both have what are termed mirror neurons because they activate when we see somebody else experiencing these things. So we can empathize with other people's situations because uh, as we observe their situation, we experience uh, a degree of what they are experiencing through these regions. Uh, so our internal sense of our own bodies changes when we see somebody else in a different state of internal um, uh, you know, uh, feeling or emotion or, or what have you. Uh, so <clears throat> moving on, um, the um, isthmus is the part of the uh, medial temporal lobe, the parahippocampal gyrus, that connects the cingulate gyrus to the parahippocampal gyrus, which we see here now in yellow. Parahippocampal gyrus is a major input to the hippocampus itself, and it also receives some of our uh, gustatory sense of smell uh, sensory information, which is why smell impacts memory so strongly. Um, then we have autobiographical information being processed in the anterior temporal uh, pole, and that region is also where the amygdala is located. Uh, uh, so, uh, emotional, internal senses processed there. Of course, our septal area here uh, in uh, the uh, subrostral portion of uh, the, um, uh, the frontal cortex. So, um, we already know that it's connected to the hypothalamus. Uh, via the um, cortico-hypothalamic tract, but we also also know already that it's connected to the hippocampus via the via the precommissural fibers of the fornix. Uh, so it uh, has a role in memory as well as uh, as inputting into these autonomic uh, functions. Now uh, these structures are all connected uh, with the. Uh, the uh, parahippocampal gyrus, especially the entorhinal cortex within it, via the cingulum. The cingulum is a white matter tract uh, at the bottom of the cingulate gyrus, at the top of the corpus callosum, runs uh, over the top of the corpus callosum, connecting these regions to the hippocampus. Uh, and, okay, so highlighting also the orbital frontal region of the frontal cortex, uh, for processing reward and, and involved in decision making, uh, deciding you know what stimulus uh, was rewarding in the past and and thus what action I should take to acquire that same stimulus again. Um, so uh, the uh, the insular cortex. I also want to talk about its role in cravings. So imagine. Uh, you know, you have a craving for a, a chocolate cupcake uh, with wonderful icing on it. Now, when I said chocolate cupcake, you could taste the taste of a chocolate cupcake and, and remember the texture of a nice fluffy chocolate cupcake. And perhaps your mouth even started watering. So that's because all of these regions are connected to all of your sensory information, your gustatory sense, your, your memory of the taste of a chocolate cupcake, and then that memory triggering the hypothalamic parasympathetic uh, innervation of your uh, sublingual glands uh, in your face to stimulate salivation, and perhaps your parotid glands as well. Uh, so that uh, example is showing you uh, in a very real sense, how this information is all connected. Uh, so uh, now we'll talk about some specific regions of the parahippocampal gyrus. The piriform cortex uh, inputs into the hippocampus, but is also uh, the primary area where that sense of olfaction is processed from our olfactory bulb. And we'll talk about the olfactory bulb in this lecture. Uh, Entorhinal cortex, also uh, the primary input into the hippocampus. We'll talk about the pathways of the hippocampus as well. Uh, Perirhinal cortex uh, and the isthmus. So we already talked about the isthmus. 
Uh, so all of these regions receive different types of information, such as um, uh, spatial memory about how things are organized in our spatial awareness. So our memory of maps or our memory of how to walk through our house, even with our eyes closed. So uh, all of those sorts of information is being inputted into the hippocampus through these regions, these specialized regions, uh, triggering this sort of memory of this spatial information or um, you know, recognition of whether or not we've seen an object before, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so uh, at any rate, uh, moving on. So let's get some more examples of how these different regions of the brain are activated. So here on the top, we have the insula. And here we have the anterior cingulate. Now remember I said the anterior cingulate and the insula both are involved in empathy and the feeling, the uh, uh, emotional uh, sense of well-being. The anterior cingulate is involved in our sense of pain and aversive stimuli, whereas the insula is involved in cravings and, and positive stimuli, things we, we enjoy and we want. So. Uh, we know this information because we pe put people in functional MRIs and show them images and we record the activity in these different areas. So I'm going to show you some of the images used in these experiments to stimulate different areas of the, um, these limbic areas. So the first is a high arousal positive state. So uh, one of the images shown in this state is apparently... Uh, 80s softcore um, porn. So anyway, um, this is this is the case. And so this image, uh, regardless of whether you're male or female, stimulates uh, to a high degree the insula. Now a high arousal negative state, uh, uh, seeing this image of this venomous snake uh, serpent, uh, is activating strongly the anterior cingulate gyrus because it's giving us this information, this painful information, uh, painful memory that we associate uh, or uh, painful association correlation with a venomous snake. Now, low arousal, uh, but it's still positive, activating the insula is this nice pastoral scene of this, uh, this cow wandering through this nice uh, green grass. Uh, and so anyway, uh, we have now a, an example of a low arousal negative state. Uh, we have this elderly uh, individual in this uh, ruinous corridor. And again, that is giving us a sense of this negative environment, uh, uh, something, someplace we don't want to be at. And so it's activating the anterior cingulate. What, however I got into this situation... Uh, I want to avoid it in the future. Uh, so that's what the anterior cingulate is saying. The uh, anterior insula is saying the opposite. However I got here, I want to remember that so I get here again. <clears throat> so here's an, uh, an example of how some of these limbic areas of the brain uh, were studied and understood. So Phineas Gage, I'm sure uh, many of you are aware uh, from other studies you've had, other classes, about this individual named Phineas Gage. He was a uh, railroad manager, and so some of his crew were uh, tamping in on iron into the ground uh, as they were building a, a railroad, uh, driving down some um, uh, black powder, some uh, explosives into the ground so that they could blow out part of a mountain and they were having trouble so uh, uh, Mr. Gage walked up and said let me handle this guys and got the sledgehammer and started pounding it in and uh, one time he hit it you know just right to cause a spark as he was leaning over it drove this uh, like uh, four foot tamping iron straight through his uh, jaw into his uh, anterior fossa, cranial fossa, obliterating a portion of his orbitofrontal uh, cortex, which is responsible for regulating our decision-making, uh, informed based on our memory of events. 
And so before this in so um, he had this injury, went straight through his brain. Uh, he remained awake and alert, sat down and waited for the only doc in town to arrive, uh, who then uh, pulled out this tamping iron and stuck his finger in Phineas's uh, brain uh, and wrote up this case report on it, studied the guy uh, for uh, decades later. And uh, Phineas Gage has now become the example of how the orbitofrontal cortex works. Before the injury, uh, Mr. Gage was a responsible individual with a family. I think he had a wife and a kid. Uh, he was the manager uh, in this company, uh, building railroads. And so obviously a responsible, upright guy. After uh, the injury, he became an alcoholic, compulsive gambler, lost his family, roamed the country, uh, not able to keep down a job. Uh, and so we understand now that that orbitofrontal cortex, which was destroyed in Mr. Gage, uh, is regulating those sorts of decision-making. So he became a very impulsive individual because uh, his orbitofrontal cortex was not regulating uh, his decision-making. He became um, motivated simply by the most proximal um, positive stimulus he could find at, at any given time. And so that might be gambling, that might be alcohol, uh, you know, that might be whatever the case may be. So if you hadn't heard before, now you have Phineas Gage. Quite the dude. Now let's talk about some of the connectivity uh, in these different regions. Basal nucleus of Maynard is, as we've mentioned before, the acetylcholinergic center of the uh, forebrain, and it has projections through the isthmus to the hippocampus. So uh, directs alertness and our focus on given uh, sensory stimuli normally, uh, but in Alzheimer's disease, this nucleus begins to degenerate uh, and we lose acetylcholinergic input into the hippocampus and we lose it throughout the cortex. So as dementia sets in, uh, these individuals become less alert to their environment, um, you know, uh, and they are less able to form new memories uh, as this occurs. In later stages, as the acetylcholine degenerates further, then they're less able to stimulate the cortex uh, just in general, so their um, memory, the ability to elicit memories is also impacted as well. Uh, okay. The septal uh, nucleus, uh, we talked about that. It contains uh, acetylcholinergic neurons as well, projects to the hippocampus through the fornix. Uh, so again, uh, formation of memory. Uh, this nucleus is critical for um, triggering the consolidation of memories based on the activity of the brain at a given moment. So that activity of the brain, that web, that network of neurons that's firing is strengthened through uh, the input of these acetylcholinergic neurons and the hippocampus that are saying the neurons that are firing together right now, uh, we should wire them together more strongly. <clears throat> so here is a cross-section drawing through the hippocampus. The hippocampus is an allocortical structure uh, it is one of these structures only has three layers uh, within the dentate gyrus, which is this most central portion of the hippocampus. So we have a molecular, a granular, and a pyramidal cell layer. The inputs onto the hippocampus come from a variety of different uh, areas. The uh, major inputs are from the entorhinal cortex. A lot of stuff uh, signals to the entorhinal cortex, and that signal uh, gets propagated to the hippocampus to uh, trigger that uh, strengthening of the connections uh, throughout the brain. So these two are called the uh, perforant pathway, here shown in green, and the uh, alveolar pathway, uh, shown in blue. They are basically uh, analogous to each other. The alveolar uh, pathway is more uh, anterior in the entorhinal cortex, but it's pretty much continuous with the perforant uh, pathway, uh, which is more posterior in the entorhinal cortex. 
And so these travel uh, throughout the, um, the dentate gyrus uh, and the hippocampus to synapse eventually on uh, things like the mossy fibers and the, um, the um, uh, dendrites of the, uh, the uh, uh, pyramidal neurons. We also have input through the fornix from the septal area uh, containing that acetylcholinergic uh, input uh, to reinforce that neuroplasticity that's being triggered by the hippocampus. <clears throat> and so that goes straight through the, uh, the fornix to the dentate uh, gyrus. And so there are a number of different areas, um, sub-areas we're talking about. Um, like the CA regions, uh, which are just uh, different pyramidal portions uh, of the dentate gyrus as it, as it goes deeper into the dentate gyrus. And they're called CA1 through 4. Uh, and uh, CA, it means cornu ammonis. So the seahorse um, has a ram's horns within it. Cornu ammonis is a ram's horn because apparently this looks like a a ram's horn. So anyway, uh, I didn't name it. But the hippocampus is a highly vascularized structure within the central nervous system, has uh, prolific capillaries within it. As we, uh, you know, age and we eat shitty food like french fries with cholesterol, that builds up um, plaques within our arteries and our capillaries um, uh, and that atherosclerotic plaque is going to end up uh, blocking off these capillaries. And as that occurs, we can see that these uh, pyramidal neurons within the CA portions of the dentate gyrus begin to de degenerate. So here is a normal uh, hippocampus. We can see the CA1 region and, uh, uh, with uh, lots of staining from these pyramidal neurons all the way through the CA3 and CA4 regions. Here we see an ischemic hippocampus. Ischemic meaning it's not getting the oxygen it needs, uh, perhaps from atherosclerosis or perhaps from uh, hemorrhage or brain damage or whatever the case may be. But at any rate, you can see the neurons in the CA1 portion of the dentate gyrus have degenerated, uh, so we're getting less ability to form memories, uh, and this is a function of uh, age and diet and all of those things that impact our bodies throughout life. So the fornix itself has a number of different targets and it has um, bidirectional fibers. So if it's going to the uh, septal area, the septal area also has fibers traveling back to the hippocampus. But we can divide the targets of the hippocampus into pre-commissural and post-commissural fibers based on whether they extend anterior to the anterior commissure or a posterior to the posterior commissure. The post-commissural travel to the mammillary bodies, pre-commissural to the septal nuclei. Um, we also have some, not shown here, we have some pre-commissural fibers heading to the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. Uh, 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 post-commissural um, behind the commissure, pre-commissural, so yeah, whatever. Uh, <clears throat> so what is long-term potentiation? I kind of mentioned that, and that's the wire together, fire together principle. When uh, the axons of one neuron release neurotransmitter onto a dendrite of another, then uh, a, a um, retrograde signal uh, causes that, uh, that inputting axon to grow and, and strengthen its connection via the production of additional uh, neurotransmitters. It also causes the synapses in the uh, postsynaptic target neuron to produce more uh, receptors and more ion channels. So here in this um, uh, classic example, we have uh, a probe recording 
within a target neuron, and we have two inputs, uh, some input axons on the left and input axons on the right. So the uh, input axons on the left, the input one axons are triggered via an electrode. And then we have the uh, recorder probe in the target neuron. So we've triggered this, uh, but we've remained, uh, the secondary input on the right has remained silent. So what happens here, we're recording and we can see uh, that uh, the postsynaptic potential at baseline is the same for the two, but when we trigger the one, that potential goes up, it skyrockets. And as it goes back to baseline, it forms a new baseline higher than the original baseline. So that's what this sensitization is. So now the next stimulation from that first uh, input one neuron doesn't have to release as much neurotransmitter in order to stimulate an action potential in the postsynaptic uh, neuron. And so this happens through uh, the different uh, ion channel recruitment. So we've got the glutamatergic uh, neurotransmitter being released in the synapse. It binds to the AMPA receptor. When we get a high enough stimulation through these AMPA receptors, that causes the NMDA receptors to depolarize, uh, which triggers the influx of calcium. That calcium is a signal to the postsynaptic neuron to stimulate um, uh, protein synthesis of uh, whatever target sequence uh, is necessary through secondary uh, signaling cascades in, inside the cell, uh, and that activity will re lead to the production of more AMPA receptors that are uh, expressed on the surface. So these AMPA receptors then get recruited, more and more of them go into that synapse, so uh, less neurotransmitter can stimulate the postsynaptic uh, uh, cell to a, uh, the same extent or to a greater extent. So that is long-term potentiation. It just means sensitization of that synapse. And it is, it is specific to inputs and outputs. So, the in, so one input doesn't sensitize all inputs onto that neuron. It only sensitizes the input that's being used at that time. <clears throat> so now let's talk about Pape's circuit. Pape's was a dude, uh, 1937, I believe. Uh, who took a mid-sagittal section of a brain and said, hey, this looks circular. And so then uh, he decided that there was a circular pathway here, and because it's circular, it must be involved in emotional processing. So that's the paper he wrote back in 1937. Look at this weird stuff. Uh, I think that because emotion is illogical and circular in nature, that this circular structure must be involved in emotion. So he was partly right. Um, in that emotion inputs into memory formation, but Pape's circuit is really critical for memory formation. You can have emotional experiences without a continuous Pape's circuit, but you have severely impaired memory formation without Pape's circuit, because you can see this circular region, if we start here at the hippocampus, travels back through the fornix to the mammillary body, up to the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, to the cingulate, through the isthmus, to the entorhinal cortex, back to the uh, hippocampus, then through the fornix again, so this circular formation. So diagrammed out, this here is Pape's uh, circuit. We have uh, information being processed, um, and that information is being fed into the cingulate uh, gyrus, cingulate gyrus says this memory is important, so let's strengthen that memory through the hippocampus and its uh, functionality as well. Uh, and then down to the mammillary bodies, the anterior thalamic nucleus is then repeating what's important, going through this whole process um, uh, of reinforcement. So that's Pape's circuit, uh, and yes, it's pronounced Pape's, uh, kind of in a one-syllable uh, sense, um, but uh, that's Pape's circuit memory. When you think of that, you're thinking of memory reinforcement uh, using limbic functions to accentuate and draw attention to certain stimuli. 
So now uh, we'll talk about the amygdala and its connections. Um, of course, we have um, the amygdala um, and its inputs to the hypothalamus via the stria terminalis, uh, regulating uh, how our memories are uh, impacting uh, and our, our emotional sense of our current environment is impacting uh, our need for fight or flight and hormone release. So you've got that. And we can also see that the amygdala is going down. So we've already talked about uh, this, the periaqueductal gray uh, in our pain lecture and how all of that's going on. Uh, so all of this, you're starting to realize how connected it is and how it makes sense that these connections need to happen for our regular processes to occur, which we experience on a daily basis. Uh, so olfactory bulb, um, let's talk about uh, cranial nerve one and its connections and its emphasis on memory formation uh, and, and how all that happens. So the olfactory mucosa is where the olfactory neuron cell bodies are. Uh, they are chemoreceptors that detect um, um, the, the um, olfactory chemicals that are wafting through the air impacting the mucosa in our nasal cavity and that triggers um, uh, an action potential through the axons uh, which travel through that cribriform plate to synapse in uh, cells, new, uh, neurons within the olfactory bulb. These cells are called mitral and tuft cells and they send their fibers through the olfactory tract. They form the olfactory tract uh, to uh, then travel more posteriorly into the brain. So damage to these structures can result in a uh, loss of smell or a weakening of smell. Uh, so uh, I mentioned before, car wrecks cause uh, a traumatic severing of the uh, olfactory axons as they travel through the cribriform plate, which can potentially cause complete anosmia. Um, uh, so there, there might be. So you might uh, be around uh, chemical toxins like maybe chlorine. Maybe you fill your pool with chlorine and uh, or acids, and you get a little bit too close as you're pouring that in, and that chemically burns some of the neurons. So that leads to a loss of uh, some of the smell because you're damaging some of the neurons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So here now we're at that olfactory tract still at the trigone, so we've gone through the tract. The trigone is the area where uh, these fibers split because each olfactory bulb uh, has a, a ipsilateral and a contralateral tract. The medial olfactory stria is the tract that goes contralateral. It travels through the anterior commissure to synapse on the contralateral uh, amygdala and piriform cortex. The lateral olfactory stria is traveling ipsilaterally to the ipsilateral piriform cortex and amygdala. So if you can imagine the uh, other contralateral tracts traveling right through here, joining up with the lateral olfactory stria to innervate those structures. Uh, so we have that there. We can see the amygdala. So uh, some interesting uh, consequences. The because of its structure and, and, and functionality, the olfactory, the piriform cortex uh, has a high degree of activity, spontaneous activity, and so seizures uh, can be isolated in and occur frequently within the piriform cortex. And so when these happen, our, our sense uh, is that we are smelling something that's not actually present. And so this, because the piriform cortex is so sensitive and because it's so closely associated with our uh, memory areas, that memories can very easily trigger uh, a, a conscious sense of a particular smell. So say you walk into your grandmother's house, your great-grandmother's house, whatever she has passed, but as soon as you walk in, the memory of her elicits the smell of her perfume or the smell of her apple pie that she cooked or her pot roast or whatever uh, memory you have. And so uh, those memories can trigger the actual conscious sensation of smelling that thing again. 
so that is called parosmia, uh, which is the uh, paranormal sense of smell, the sensing something that's not present, uh, parosmia. And so, uh, at any rate, that is the limbic system in a nutshell, uh, the circuitry involved and how that circuitry uh, impacts our actual, uh, you know, uh, conscious sense of our daily activities and our memory formation. So I hope you enjoyed uh, this lecture, which was kind of trying to bring it all together, uh, as well as showing you the actual anatomy of these regions. Uh, and I will see you next time. Thanks for listening.